Wilton. Please make time to assist with the Bring Back to Life convention in March. And during Lent, uh, there'll be Stations of the Cross around 7 p.m. each Friday evening. If you can attend this, it'll be a good sacrifice for Lent. My dear friends, I'd like to speak to you today. I'd like to do a series once again, as I do every Lent. And today I'd like to speak to you on Gethsemane. Gethsemane is the place of the greatest drama in all of history. It is the beginning of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all four of the evangelists tell the horrible events that happened on the night of Holy Thursday. Through the eyes of the evangelists, we see our Lord overwhelmed with fear and sadness. We see our Lord betrayed into the hands of his enemies. We see him hurried from one tribunal to another, him mocked, we see him spit upon, we see him scourged and crowned with thorns, we see him condemned to death, the death of the cross, and left to die upon that cross. This all began on Holy Thursday night. The evangelists are the first historians to the life and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. St. Matthew and St. Mark, they speak of the garden simply as a country place called Gethsemane. St. Luke calls it a place on Mount of Olives. And St. John says it is a beyond the torrent of Sidon, to Chadron, where there is a garden. Judas knew of this place. Since Jesus had often met there together with his disciples, it could have been a private estate or most probably an olive grove, which was grown for the benefit of the community. For the name Gethsemane means olive press. We believe it was enclosed by some sort of a wall, whether it was of stone or of hedge. There was some sort of perimeter for the soldiers entered into the garden and they apprehended Jesus. St. Luke tells us that Jesus went to the Mount of Olives according to custom. It was his custom. It is likely that it, there was a little shelter built there for the gardener or the keeper of the garden. And our Lord, when he was outside the city, they closed the gates at a certain time. Perhaps he was outside praying or on his journey from one city to another. And so he could not enter into the city. He would not go to Bethany, which was a mile or two away. He would spend the night in Gethsemane, largely in prayer. There's a beautiful basilica there now and a garden which marks the spot which our Lord began his agony. Olive trees there today are slips taken from the ancestral trees which witnessed our Lord's agony in the garden. The garden is about 200 yards from the enclosure of the temple. The first church that was built there was built in 380 between 380 and 390 AD. The temperature in Jerusalem in March and in April varies, but we know that that very night that Christ was betrayed, that it was chilly. For later, we read in the scriptures, Peter would be warming himself by the fire. That night, Jesus and 11 of his apostles crossed the bridge over the Chadron River and entered into the garden. Once inside, our Lord turned to eight of the apostles and he said, sit down and wait while I go over yonder and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him and he went a little further into 
the garden, perhaps where the ape could not see. He was already beginning to feel the first onslaught of fear and sadness. And he said to his favored three, wait here, but he told them to watch. Watch with me. And Jesus was both God and man, so it is not any surprise that he became tired. He became hungry. He became cold. This king was born in a stable. Nothing should surprise us. Always before there had been a sureness in himself. An utter fearlessness, a complete certainty, an assurance in his every word, in his every act. But at Gethsemane, there's a change. Christ's sadness and disturbance of mind, his prayers repeated over and over as he lay prostrate on the ground, the apparent contradiction between his will and the will of his Father. The events that took place in the Garden of Gethsemane are so hard to comprehend that even some of the greatest fathers of the church find it a challenge to explain these great truths. Our Lord chose Peter, James, and John to accompany him. They had been especially selected to witness the raising of the daughter of Jairus back to life. They had been chosen to witness the transfiguration where our Lord Jesus Christ spoke with Moses and Elias. They were more prepared than the other apostles for the contest which lay ahead. They were probably the apostles Jesus loved most and from whose presence he had the greatest hope to receive comfort during this time of supreme trial in the garden. Our Lord departed from his custom of praying in private and sought three that he might, that might comfort him and might better understand man's redemption by witnessing the beginning of their master's suffering. Even before he departed the company of the three, sadness had already gripped his soul. As he said to them, my soul is sorrowful even unto death. St. John tells us that he added this proclamation to this proclamation, a petition. Father, save me from this hour. The sorrow was so acute that it was capable of killing someone. He told them to wait here and to watch with me. It was by no means for himself that he asked for their prayers. For he added, pray that you may not enter into temptation. He specified why he wanted them to pray. And he says the same to you. And he says the same to me. You must pray if you wish to escape temptation. At that very moment, plans were being made in the dark, darkest corner of Jerusalem to destroy our Lord Jesus Christ. All his life he had looked forward to the Passion without fear, even with an eagerness we remember the scripture scholars tell us that he anxiously led the apostles to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, knowing that he would not survive the week. But now the dread reality was upon him. There was an element of terror. There was an element of sorrow. For as scripture says, he was exceedingly troubled. Jesus departed about 30 paces from the other apostles. There was a full moon out that night, the first Paschal moon. The three apostles could see him clearly. 
they could hear him also as he was accustomed to pray aloud. The three did not fall asleep immediately. So they understood some of what Christ was enduring. They saw our Lord first fall to the ground. And then lying prostrate, he cried out to his heavenly Father, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass away from me. Yet not as I will, but as thou willest. On the Mount of the Transfiguration, Jesus' divinity was so apparent that he appeared hardly human. Here at Gethsemane, his humanity is so apparent that he appears hardly divine. Always before he had spoken in kind words of the Father, now he sends to heaven an appeal filled with anger. Often before our Lord had prayed to the Father, as God he needed not to pray, whatever he willed, he accomplished, or was accomplished. But he was also man, possessed of a human will and natural inclination. And it was as man that he prayed here in Gethsemane that night. Remember your illustrious patron. St. Teresa said one of her greatest regrets in life was to not study the humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. His will was conditional. We read in Scripture, not as I will, but as thou willest. We learn from our Lord that in the very moment of greatest anguish that we must turn to the Father with all confidence and resignation, as did our Lord Jesus Christ. Never before had he distinguished his will from his will and that of his Father. He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. It is only an apparent contradiction, distinction of the two. When Jesus Christ became man, he took to himself a complete and perfect human nature. It was natural, therefore, for Christ as we to abhor suffering. Like the rest of us, our Lord Jesus Christ felt a natural inclination towards the pleasant, and he felt a natural aversion towards the painful. As God, Jesus had a divine will. As man, Jesus had a human will. It is the human will which is referred to here, this night in the Garden of Gethsemane. Christ's natural will shrinks from the passion. His rational will is in perfect conformity with his Father's will. Our Lord Jesus Christ accepted without question the chalice of the Passion. Christ's prayer is a perfect example of what our prayers should be. First of all, we should start our prayers with filial confidence in God. He calls him my Father. Second, we should request deliverance from some temptation if possible. And thirdly, we should end our prayers with resignation and thanksgiving to Almighty God. Jesus returned to receive, to the three, to receive consolation. He's greatly disappointed. How often do we disappoint him? He is greatly disappointed to find them asleep it's difficult to understand how they could have fallen asleep seeing their master begin his agony in such pain and anguish. Jesus roused them from their sleep with a gentle reproach addressed directly to Peter. Simon, dost thou sleep? Couldst thou not watch one hour? 
He asks us that every first Friday. Could we not watch one hour with him? He calls to Simon to demonstrate to Peter that Peter had not yet become the rock that the church would need. Just a short while before Peter had boasted that he would follow our Lord even until death. Our Lord once again says to Peter, watch and pray. We must all watch and pray that we enter not into temptation. Trials and temptations there must be in life, but vigilance and prayer assure us of victory. We read from the scripture that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. A man, a woman, may be full of goodwill, may be full of good intention, but these can be brought to nothing in a moment of trial through human weakness. And we see that every time we fall. Jesus returned to prayer, and this time there's only one mention of his Father's will. He shortly returns to the apostles and he finds them asleep again. Certainly the three had made an effort to remain awake, but once again they slumber. All three were too ashamed to respond to our Lord the second time. And so our Lord leaves them and he goes a third time to pray. The struggle in the soul of our Lord was mounting each time he left the apostles, mounting in intensity. For it was during this final prayer, since he did not receive consolation from the three, that heaven sends an angel to strengthen him, and that he suffered an agony and a bloody sweat at that time. Mankind was asleep at his birth, and now mankind was, is asleep at the beginning of his passion. It was an angel in human form, as the expression used by St. Luke indicates, an apparition of visible to the bodily eyes. An angel announced Christ's coming. The choir of angels proclaimed his birth. In the desert, the angel came and ministered unto him. And here at the climax of his agony, an angel is sent from heaven. It is likely that the angel brought strength both for body and for soul. Some think that the angel spoke to our Lord, reminding him of the great good his passion and his death would accomplish. By his acceptance of help from the angel, our Lord manifested his humility. For in fact, as man, and I quote scripture, thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, giving him a human nature. Agony is used to express the supreme anguish which gripped the soul of our Lord Jesus Christ in the struggle to accept the passion by his human will. As a result of this racking interior anguish, our Lord suffered a bloody sweat. And his sweat became as drops of blood running down to the ground. The conflict which took place in Christ's soul manifested itself in a bloody sweat. This bloody sweat had long been recognized by the medical world as the fruit of great, the great onslaught of fear and sorrow. At the conclusion of this third prayer, peace once again reigned in the heart of Jesus. He was now ready for the way of the cross. The weakness of his human nature did not prevail over his spirit, over his soul. He would not stumble again until he carried the wood of the cross on Good Friday. God love you. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.